All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for the invitation, Paul. And uh, we'll see if I can do the control here. Um, so, yeah, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, tell you a little bit about the, the origin of marine magnetic anomalies and maybe in a bit more detail than, than you've heard before. And I'm hoping that this will be of, of uh, some use when I guess next, the next uh, lecture is going to be by Richard Gordon and maybe he'll talk about anomalous skewness, among other things. So hopefully this will give you a little bit of background that will be useful for that. So I wanted to start out with um, with just a couple of basic slides to make sure we're all sort of on the same same page. Um, so this first one is just some anomaly basics. I gather you've all done a little bit of uh, modeling and tried out a few anomaly modeling programs. Um, so this uh, image shows you uh, basically a forward model of uh, uh, anomaly model that's calculated at the pole. So that's with the ambient field and the magnetization both vertically downwards. So the sea surface anomaly is in the top box there. It's the, it's the black curve. And that's calculated about three kilometers above the source. And then I've also calculated uh, what the anomaly would look like a little closer to the source, about 500 meters above, and that's the blue line. So the um, the bottom figure there shows what the what the corresponding magnetization model is. So you can see it goes out a few million years on either side of the ridge. And um, the point of that is, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, but the signal in these lineated magnetic anomalies, it's a geomagnetic signal and it should include both direction and intensity. And so the gray line in the bottom there is an intensity model with just some Gaussian fluctuations. And then the red is a filtered version of that that might come, for example, from the filtering associated with the crustal accretion process. So just looking back at the top uh, figure there, just remember that as we're closer down to the, to the source, you'll get uh, more uh, higher amplitudes and more short wavelength information. And so that'll be important in some of the things that come uh, in the later in the talk. So another thing that we'll look at is the shape or the skewness of magnetic anomalies. And so in the top here, I've shown the black anomaly curve um, is simply the one calculated at the pole that we saw in the last diagram at the sea surface. And I just want to uh, remind you that the shape or skewness of the anomalies depends on the geometry of the spreading system as well as the orientation of the remnants, uh, that's m dir, and b dir is the ambient field direction. So the little cartoon in the bottom sort of illustrates that. Uh, you see the, the purple parallelopiped there is supposed to represent the, the crustal lineations. And uh, if those uh, rocks that are lineated in that direction have a remnants that's shown by the sort of heavy gray line or heavy gray arrow. What counts in determining the magnetic anomaly is basically the projection of that remnants vector into the plane that's perpendicular to the lineation. So that's labeled MX and MZ down in the purple um, lineation down below. So when we calculate anomalies, um, What's predictable from this geometry um, is the skewness, and what you can do is you can then phase shift the anomalies to try and make them like they were uh, constructed at the pole. And if that's successful, then we understand how that works. Um, sometimes there's anomalous skewness, which is not predicted by this geometry, and that's something we'll come back to. That could have to do with, for example, uh, tilting of some of the source layers, um, and so we'll come back to that a little later. So uh, another thing that I, just to make sure we're all um, sort of starting from the same place, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the sort of physics of um, the magnetization process. And I'm sure um, that everyone's familiar with at least the top uh, property that's referred to here. So the top diagram shows essentially the magnetization of a magnetic material um, as a function of temperature. That's the blue line. And that's one of two properties of uh, things that you would consider magnetic materials or ferromagnets. Um, and that reflects a long range ordering that occurs below the Curie temperature. So the, the Curie temperature for this case, this is for pure magnetite, which has a Curie temperature of about 575 C. 
And uh, below that temperature, the, all the moments in the magnetite, uh, all the magnetic moments that come from unpaired electrons um, are lined up. And then when you get above that temperature, that long range ordering goes away. So the, the Curie temperature is really a function only of the type of magnetic mineral that you have. So this particular one's for magnetite and we'll look at uh, in the ocean crust, we have some different uh, magnetic mineralogies. The second property of magnetic materials that you may be less familiar with is the one shown in the bottom figure. So that shows a picture of uh, what's called magnetic hysteresis. So essentially this means that the things that have permanent uh, magnetization uh, or remnants when you've taken the field away, um, that is a function of what the history of the applied fields have been to that material. So if we start at the beginning at the origin of that diagram that shows B being the, the horizontal axis is the applied field and M is the magnetization. If we start at the origin there and apply a field, you can see the green curve rises up and then finally saturates. And then if we reverse the fields uh, and take it back down to zero, you'll see the point labeled MRS is actually the magnetization that remains. And if we were to go around the loop, you'd actually see that when we go to negative fields, we'd come back and we'd get the opposite uh, uh, magnetization direction. So this lower uh, property of hysteresis is actually a function of having um, anisotropy in the crystal so that there are easier uh, directions in which to magnetize the grain and harder directions. And it takes some energy to move from one of those easy directions to another one. Um, so in the next slide, um, I just wanted to remind you that what we think is happening, uh, we're pretty sure is happening in the ocean crust, is that the magnetization we have there is primarily uh, thermal in origin. And I just, this is a little complicated figure, but I'll, I'll step you through it just to give you an idea of the physics of what's happening. So in the previous slide, we saw that we had both a temperature effect and an anisotropy at the, at the crystal scale. And these two things compete to um, allow a magnetic grain to acquire a remnant. So if you think about uh, during cooling, when we have new lavas uh, or dikes at the ocean uh, spreading center that are in place, those things will cool. And as they do so, the thermal energy decreases. And at the same time, it turns out that those energy barriers within the grain uh, increase in size. So it becomes harder and harder to change the direction of the magnetization. So these two diagrams show on the, on the y-axis is basically grain volume, and the yellow uh, contours there are for a particular grain size distribution. And the uh, x-axis is a measure of those energy barriers. And then the curves on there show you the sort of time scales over which the magnetization might change um, at, a, at a particular temperature. So you'll notice that the blue curve is actually a really short time scale, 100 seconds. So that means basically the grains are sort of following whatever the field is doing. And then if you go to just a little bit higher energy barriers, you can see the green and then the red curves are actually uh, conditions under which the magnetization would be stable for very long time periods, a million years or the, the age of the Earth in, in the case of the red curve. So the, the top curve or the top uh, plot shows what happens at high temperature and then as we cool, we go to the condition in the, in the bottom figure there and essentially what's happened is those energy barriers have, have gotten bigger and we've trapped the magnetic moments in those grains into whatever the, the field orientation was. So at high temperatures, we'd have things that are following the fields and then over a really, turns out a really narrow range of temperatures, the direction of magnetization gets locked into those grains. So that's kind of um, the process in a nutshell of how this thermal magnetization gets uh, acquired in the ocean crust. And it turns out, we'll come back to this, that it's really small particles that are the best at uh, recording and maintaining this, this field information. The, uh, vertical scale on those is in zeta meters cubed, which is uh, 10 to the minus 21 um, cubic meters, and that corresponds to sort of micron-sized grains, which are the, the really um, good recorders of the magnetic field.
All right. So now with those uh, basics behind us, um, uh, here's a, an outline of what I'd like to talk about. Um, so I'm going to start out uh, telling you a little bit about um, or trying to answer this first question, which is, does the crustal magnetization really preserve, as we think it should, a record of what the intensity of the field was and how we might go about um, testing that and demonstrating that that's the case? And then we'll go on and look at um, some of the, the source layers that are responsible for the magnetic anomalies, starting with the lavas, and then we'll move to uh, deeper source layers and then come back and talk a little bit about how crustal accretion affects the, the shape of anomalies in particular. All right, so um, this first question is, is do we really have in marine magnetic anomalies, do we have a record of uh, intensity variations of the field in addition to directional variations? So if the magnetization of the crust is actually a thermal remnant, then we really should have both of those. So we know the main anomalies come from the directional changes. And one illustration that people notice quite early on that there's additional information possible in those sea surface anomalies um, is that you often see short wavelength anomalies within a constant polarity interval. And a good example of that, uh, one of the nicest examples, I think, is the, the diagram on the left. So this is uh, sea surface anomaly profiles over anomaly five, which is about a million year long normal polarity interval about 10 to 11 million years ago. And these are from the Northeast Pacific and if you look at those uh, anomaly profiles, you can see that in addition to the main reversals, you have a number of uh, sort of four or five smaller wavelength features within anomaly five that look to be very consistent across um, what turns out to be about 100 kilometers or so along strike. So an explanation of that was suggested um, back in the early 90s and even in an earlier paper that Steve Candy had uh, that that those small wavelength variations might be reflecting um, intensity variations of the field. And the model is essentially shown in this right-hand diagram. Um, so for anomaly, sea surface anomalies between um, anomaly 26 and 27, uh, the idea here is that if you have intensity variations that are just uh, variations about a mean, shown in the bottom uh, sort of block model as the fuzzy line there, what happens is that the, the earth filter uh, being far above the magnetic source is going to sort of filter that signal and what you'll see is these characteristic short wavelength anomalies whose wavelength is, is really set by the earth filter. Uh, so you'll see different character at different spreading rates but they'll always have about the same um, wavelength. So. Um, I showed you early on a, a model of how things can be different if you uh, measure the magnetic anomaly near the, nearer the source. And so an obvious thing to do was to look at um, anomaly 5, uh, where we had these nice sea surface anomalies, and to see what you get if you were to tow a magnetometer near the bottom. And that's what's shown in the, in the figure on the left, is again in the northeast Pacific, so a series of near bottom profiles were collected uh, a few hundred meters above the source. There's a little bit of sediment there. Um, so the top um, anomaly profile shows you a summary or a stack, an average of the sea surface anomaly profiles there. And you can see there uh, we have, in addition to the, the main reversals, if you look within the longest uh, normal polarity block there, there's actually three different lows that are labeled 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4. So those are the ones we saw in the earlier compilation of sea surface uh, profiles. And now what happens if we go nearer the source is illustrated with the black curves that are below that. So what happens to those um, anomaly lows within cron 5 at the sea surface is when we go nearer the bottom, those um, become more complex um, but still lineated patterns. So the expectation if those were all related to short reversals um, would be that they would become 
more and more like the short reversed intervals, say at uh, 5.1 there at the, at the young end of, of cron 5. And instead what happens is they just become more complicated. They're not quite as linear, uh, but they're still pretty lineated. So the interpretation of this was that these uh, short wavelength variations are really unlikely to represent uh, reversals. And instead, that's probably a signal of the intensity variations of the field. Um, if you wanted to test that, well, uh, you could do a couple of things. One is that intensity variations, like directional variations, at least some part of the intensity variation should be global. And so you should see the same sort of pattern if you went to uh, different uh, spreading areas. And one example is shown on the bottom there. That's from a much faster spreading rate on the west flank of the East Pacific rise. And if you look at sea surface anomaly profiles there, you see that, yes, indeed, we do see the same uh, three lows within the main part of Cron 5. You see a little bit more detail there because of the faster spreading rate. So I think um, for many people, when this uh, study was published, I think many people would agree, based on these data, that there is some geomagnetic signal that's preserved in the anomalies. It's a little slow one there. Um, so, w we might ask if there's another way that we can sort of confirm this, and uh, one that occurred to, to us uh, some time ago was that um, we should actually go to a place, look at anomalies where we have some independent record of what the field was doing. And we decided to go look at what's happening in the central anomaly or the Bruins uh, cron, this most recent normal polarity interval. And the benefit of going there is that uh, we have independent uh, estimates of what the field intensity was doing, and we get those primarily from sedimentary cores. So the figure on the bottom left there shows the distribution of a bunch of marine cores and some lake cores that have been looked at to uh, try and estimate the intensity of the field. And in sediments, of course, uh, those don't have a thermal remnant, but it turns out that when the sediment's deposited, they also have a magnetization that's roughly proportional to the, to the field intensity. So we can use an average um, intensity record from the sedimentary cores, and if you simply do that in, um, in the brunes and use that as uh, the magnetization for the crust, you can produce little models. Those are shown in green on the figure in right. Uh, for different spreading rates. And then in between those are some actual profiles that have spreading rates in between those. And you can see that it's a, the, the predicted sea surface anomaly profiles agree reasonably well, not perfectly, but reasonably well with what you might predict from this, um, these sedimentary records of intensity variations. So then um, you might ask what happens if you go a little nearer the source, um, and this experiment's been done as well um, on the southern East Pacific rise, which is spreading quite fast. Um, and the figure on the left shows the results of that study. So a number of near bottom profiles, uh, in this case about 75 meters or so above the seafloor were collected. And these were spaced over about 50 kilometers long strike. So a pretty good section of the ridge. The sea surface anomaly profile that you get, an average of that is shown in the top. So that's kind of the pattern we saw in the last um, compilation of things from the Bruins. Um, the next uh, profile down is actually an average or a stack of all the near bottom anomaly profiles. And just as we saw with the Cron 5 um, anomalies, the sea surface anomaly profiles here become more complicated when you get near the bottom, um, but turn out to be reasonably lineated as well. And then the third curve down is actually the magnetization uh, that you can infer from those anomaly amplitude variations. And in order to do that, what we do is we take, um, you have to take into account the topographic variations and where the measurement was made above those. And if you do that, you can get an estimate of the, the magnetization of the rocks for a particular thickness layer, and that's what's shown in the third curve. And then at the bottom is actually the, the sediment intensity records uh, as it was known uh, back in 2000. 
And you can see that uh, while not agreeing in every detail, there's actually quite a few similarities between the anomaly, the magnetization uh, solution, and the sediment relative intensity records. So in particular, right in the middle of the Bruins there at 400,000 years, there's this low that appears in all those records. Uh, there's another one at about 200,000 years, and then another one right near the Bruins Matiyama boundary out on the right-hand side. So I think this is another good indication uh, that we can see an intensity record in the seafloor magnetization. And then there's one final thing we can do uh, to check, and that is that we can actually make an estimate of what the absolute field intensity was at the time rocks uh, cooled and acquired their magnetization. Um, and we do that essentially by taking a sample and then we try and reproduce or mimic the, the cooling that happened in nature, but this time we do it in the presence of a field, uh, an applied field that we know the value of. And uh, in order for this experiment to work, you have to have samples that have nice fine particles of uh, magnetite so that they're good recorders of the field. And you also have to have samples that aren't going to alter too much when you heat them up over and over again. And it turns out that the glassy margins of uh, submarine lavas have such fine-grained magnetite and they turn out to be just pretty much ideal recorders of the absolute field intensity. So the figure that's shown here is actually the red dots in the top figure are the intensities that were uh, determined from looking at these surface samples. And below that is the magnetization inferred from one of the near bottom profiles uh, where the samples were collected. And you can see the track and the bathymetry down in the bottom figure there. And I think um, we can see quite a lot of similarities between the field intensity variations in the top and what the magnetization is doing. Uh, so this is another good indication that we're seeing a, a geomagnetic signal. You'll note that the, the upper figure there, the paleointensity signal, uh, seems to be a little bit broader than what you see in the crust, and that we'll come back to a little bit later. That has to do with the, the distance that lava flows travel sort of away from the ridge crest, sort of a spillover distance. All right, so hopefully that uh, convinced you a little bit that, um, that we have some uh, geomagnetic intensity information preserved in the crust. And of course, if you're thinking about it in terms of um, uh, tectonic applications, um, one thing that this holds promise for is that if we can sort of define what some of these major intensity variations are, you might actually be able to use those as extra temporal markers, even in an area where you have constant polarity. So we're not quite there yet, but I think there's uh, the possibility of getting there in the future. So now I want to go on to um, the next segment and tell you a little bit about uh, the magnetization in the uppermost the layer, so the lavas, and how those get magnetized. And I thought I would start that um, with telling you a little bit about why we think the lavas are the dominant source of marine magnetic anomalies. And this is... Um, the figures here are from a classic paper by Monik Talwani and others in 1971. Um, and they're from uh, anomaly surveys along the Reykjanes Ridge, south of Iceland. And what these guys did was very clever. So they, they first looked at a profile along the axis of the Reykjanes Ridge. So that's the top figure. And what's shown in black there is the bathymetric variations along the ridge. It's quite shallow, um, 500 to 1,000 meters. And then directly above that, you see the anomaly profile that's observed, a few thousand nanoteslas. And they said, okay, what happens if we just try and magnetize that bathymetry with a normal polarity magnetization? Let's figure out how intensely magnetized the rocks have to be to match that anomaly. And you can see the upper model there does quite a good job. If you assume that the magnetization intensity is about uh, 30 amps per meter. So then they did the next test, which is to go um, and collect another profile, also parallel to the ridge, but now over uh, an interval where the crust is reversely magnetized. 
And that's shown in the bottom figure. So there's a little bit of sediment here. That's what's shown in gray. But if you look at the bathymetry, the basement uh, topography, which is shown in black, and compare that with the anomaly data above, you'll see that they're inversely correlated, which they should be. And again, you can do the same trick and just magnetize that bathymetry. And you find that you can account for those anomalies pretty well with uh, an intensity that's about a factor of two to three lower than what's on axis there. So then taking these intensity estimates, you can then go and look at a cross-axis profile. And knowing the intensities that we've just determined, you can actually figure out how thick the layer needs to be. And it turns out from these data, they suggested that the thickness was about 400 meters or so. Now, we'll come back a little bit later in the talk. I'll show you that um, it, there's pretty good indications that deeper layers also contribute. Um, but this is, this is pretty a pretty good estimate and shows that the lavas are really an important contributor. So <clears throat> you'd think the, the lava layer is the easiest one for us to access. We have lots of samples from, uh, from drilling and from dredging and you'd think we'd have a very good estimate of what the average intensity is and how it might change um, over time. Uh, it turns out that there's uh, several things that make that a little easier said than done. And I'll, I'll tell you about three of those things. So the first one is uh, illustrated in this slide is uh, we'll talk a little bit about the magnetic grain size. And then I'll tell you a little bit about geochemical variations in lavas. And then finally about uh, what might happen when you expose lavas to seawater is that they get altered and that changes the magnetic uh, signal as well. So this uh, first topic, I just want to give you one illustration about um, how grain size in a lava flow can change the magnetic signal. This happens to be an example from a 1993 lava flow that erupted on uh, the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And um, as you can imagine, when you have submarine lavas, uh, they're cooling uh, very rapidly and what that does is you have big gradients, thermal gradients, and they just give you big changes in the size of, of all the grains in the rock, but the ones we're concerned about are the, are the magnetic particles. So over centimeter scales, you have big changes in those properties. And what's shown in the top diagram is that we took a slab of uh, this new flow um, perpendicular to the chilled margin, which is out on the left side there, and then we cut that into little slabs that were about a centimeter thick and measured their magnetic properties. So that's the letters across the top. And what you see in that top figure with the solid symbols is how the magnetization changes as you go into the pillow. And near the margin, it's very low. And in fact, it goes almost to zero when you're in the glass and then increases um, a few centimeters below the glassy margin and then decreases further towards the interior. Um, so the other curve that's on that top plot is um, effectively a, an amount of magnetic material that's in the rock. So that's um, a parameter that comes from one of those hysteresis loop measurements. And you can see that increases more and more as you go deeper into the pillow. But really the biggest magnetic signal comes from the very fine grain particles out near the, near the margin. So the bottom diagram here is a little information about the composition of the magnetic particles in these seafloor lavas. And really the take home message here is that uh, the, for the most part, when you look in the interiors of lava flows, they have uh, titanomagnetites. So not pure magnetite, but one with uh, about 60 mole percent of the, the titanium end member, Olvo spinel. And those compositions that I've denoted here as TM60, um, those have uh, Curie temperatures that are really quite low, about 150 degrees or so. So the profile on the bottom, the curve there shows how the Curie temperature changes as you go into the lava flow. And you can see it decreases rapidly to those, those low values. And then the, uh, the blue histograms are... Uh, data from some really detailed studies that were done of this sample from the group at Michigan uh, using TEM observations. And they were looking, able to look at very small grains to look at their compositional variations. And you see that indeed they have this uh, TM60 composition in the interior and it's a little more variable at the outside near the glassy margin.
So uh, we'll come back and I'll, I'll mention these grain size variations uh, in a few subsequent slides. And now I want to tell you a little bit about um, another intrinsic factor that can affect the, the magnetization in lavas, and that's the geochemistry of the lavas. Um, so if you think about what happens at a mid-ocean ridge, we have melt delivered, and the melt is sitting around in shallow magma chambers um, where it can fractionate. And when it fractionates at low pressures, what happens is that the, the iron content of the liquid increases. And so to first order, you might expect that if we have more and more iron in the melt, that what should happen is we should make more titanomagnetites, which have lots of iron and titanium in them. And that, in turn, should give us higher magnetization and magnetic anomaly amplitudes. And, and this is an idea that's been around for a long time, since the early 1970s, and it was, it was termed magnetic telechemistry to indicate that you could look at anomaly amplitudes and say something about the chemistry of the crust. So the, the uh, diagram on the left is a uh, magnetization pattern around the East Pacific rise at 9 to 10 degrees north. So this is not the anomalies themselves, but what you infer about the magnetization of the, of the source um, based on the anomaly pattern. And what you can see there right in the middle of the, of the plot is these sort of red and brown colors that represent quite high magnetizations up to about a maximum of uh, 40 amps per meter. And those are uh, reflecting the sort of wake of a propagating rift system that's right around uh, 903 on the East Pacific rise there. So you see these high magnetization areas um, associated with propagating rifts and near fracture zones. Um, and actually it can be quite a big contrast depending on how, how much the iron uh, varies. So if you want to isolate um, what that signal is um, for how the magnetization varies with iron, that, that turns out also not to be um, uh, particularly straightforward. Uh, we know that the magnetic field intensity can um, modulate the magnetization of the rocks, and uh, that can be, you know, as much as a factor of five or more. Uh, we also know that we have this grain size uh, variation within a lava flow, and so if you want to isolate, um, and also um, things that can happen as a function of time, namely alteration, which we'll talk about next. So if you want to isolate what the the response is to increased iron content, then you need to sort of control for all those other factors. And one way to do that is to look at the magnetization of axial lavas. So the plot that's shown here on the left is uh, uh, an example of doing this along the southern part of the East Pacific rise. And the top plot shows um, the iron of the lavas, so the iron uh, geochemical variations from about eight to about 15% uh, iron. And then uh, the uh, natural remnant magnetization or the remnants uh, of the resulting samples. And you'll see that uh, if we take into account this grain size variation by subsampling our lavas, and uh, now we have the benefits because we're right on the axis that the, the field intensity uh, should be pretty much the same. Um, and um, there's been little time for alteration, so the variations that you see here really must be attributed mostly to just the geochemistry. And you see that it's a big effect. So you go from, if you have low iron, you may have only a, a magnetization of 10 amps per meter, whereas if you get to the higher iron uh, sorts of lavas, that could be a factor of five or more higher. So the lower two uh, diagrams here just show you how you might apply that. So this is uh, the middle plot shows you the anomaly pattern along the axis of this part of the East Pacific rise. And you can see there's, you know, hundreds of nanoteslas of variation. The big drop at about uh, 21 degrees south is a, is a big overlapping spreading center. And then down below that, you can see uh, two curves. So the one in red is the magnetization that's inferred for the crust based on the anomaly pattern. So here we have a, uh, there's a magma chamber, so we sort of limited, we know the source layer can only be as thick as um, down to the magma chamber. And so if you solve for what that magnetization is, you get the red curve. And then the black dots there 
are the chemistry that's been measured on the samples um, at the surface. So you can see that there's a, there's a pretty good agreement, at least in the big features. Not every uh, change in the surface geochemistry is, uh, has a corresponding change in the overall magnetization, but it's, uh, but it's a pretty good match. So again, so now we have uh, intensity of the field that can give you big changes, grain size that can give you big changes uh, in magnetization, and now uh, chemistry that can do the same. So one uh, final uh, thing uh, that we might want to know about is uh, for those of us who are interested in uh, maybe not so much tectonics, but looking at what the, these marine magnetic anomalies can tell us about the geomagnetic field, uh, one thing that we're interested in that regard is, is looking at any time changes in the magnetization, uh, because those might in turn be tied to, to what's happening in the geomagnetic field. Um, so. Uh, there's a, a complication here as well. So this, this diagram summarizes some early observations that were made, um, mostly from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, which is spreading fairly slowly. And what you observe at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, the top profile there uh, is a sea surface anomaly profile going out about 150 kilometers on either side of the ridge. And what you can see is that the central anomaly, or the, this most recent uh, Bruins interval, really stands out. So it has a much higher amplitude than things further off axis. And it turns out that you also have um, a corresponding signal in the magnetization of samples from the seafloor. So that's shown at the bottom, um, again, from the, the sort of mid-Atlantic ridge, about 45 degrees north. And here you're looking at distance from the axis and then the magnetization of the samples um, as a function of that. Those are the red dots. And this is data that was uh, published in 1970 and I think had, were, were really very influential. You'll see if you look um, away from the axis that the intensities of magnetization are about 10 amps per meter or a little bit less. And if you go right on axis, you find values that are incredibly high, sort of up to 100 amps per meter or so. So the interpretation of this and the anomaly data together were that, uh, that what's going on is that you're altering or oxidizing the magnetite in the rocks, and that's reducing the magnetization. And the lower right-hand figure here actually shows that, you know, this is, a, this is a photomicrograph of a big titanomagnetite grain, tens of microns across, and you can see the little cracks running through there in the lighter color. So those are indications that this oxidation at low temperatures by being bathed in seawater has occurred. And that, in fact, does happen. We can, uh, we can see it petrographically. And it does lower the magnetization of the rocks. So this all seemed to be a very nice story, that we had a big reduction um, in anomaly amplitudes and magnetization as you go away from the axis. But it turns out that it's, uh, it's maybe not that simple. So this figure shows you a compilation of some anomaly profiles at different spreading rates. So going from slow spreading at the top to faster spreading down below. Um, all of these profiles extend out about uh, to anomaly five, so about 10 to 11 million years on either side. And what you'll see is that at the slower uh, spreading rates, the top two profiles, the central anomaly really does stand out, and you have a big decrease in anomaly amplitude. Uh, but as you go to faster spreading rates, that, that, really, that signal is much more subtle. So the central anomaly really isn't as uh, pronounced a feature at these faster spreading rates. So it's a little difficult looking at that to, um, to say that we have some big scale reduction in the magnetization that comes from alteration of the, of the lavas. Um, and if you want to understand why um, we may have this, um, this difficulty in sort of seeing the effects of low temperature alteration, um, there's another study that's shown here. The plot here is, uh, is actually some direct determinations of how oxidized the magnetite grains are in some uh, basalt samples from the seafloor. So this was again done by uh, transmission electron microscopy with the uh, University of Michigan group. And what's plotted there is age as a log scale. 
on the x-axis and then the oxidation parameter on the y-axis with uh, zero being completely unoxidized and one being completely oxidized. Uh, if you got all the way up to a value of one, that would correspond to about a factor of four reduction in the magnetization of the, of the titanomagnetites. But I think what you can see from this figure is that uh, while it's clear that such oxidation happens, um, we can determine it directly, uh, but it's also very heterogeneous. So uh, to point that out, if you look all the way at the right-hand side of the diagram, that's the oldest seafloor that's been sampled by drilling uh, from hole 801 at about 160 million years, and it has one of the lowest oxidation states um, that, that have been observed. So very heterogeneous oxidation, but there's definitely an effect. And so what, if anything, can we say about um, any temporal changes in the magnetization of the lavas? Um, and the answer is it's, it's difficult. Um, the figure in the bottom right shows you a compilation of all the samples that have been measured from drill core uh, sampling of the extrusives um, as a function of age. And note that the, the intensity scale here is, is logarithmic. So uh, the circles show you sites, magnetizations from sites that have uh, pretty good penetration into the lavas, so more than 50 meters. And then the red pluses have uh, less penetration than that, and sometimes only a few samples. So what you can see if you look at that diagram is that, yes, there does seem to be a decrease in the magnetization as you go out into the Cenozoic, sort of the first few tens of millions of years, from maybe 10 amps per meter down to a few amps per meter. But then it seems to come back up in the, in the Cretaceous. So there's uh, been a number of papers on what this, uh, this sort of variation over time might mean. Um, whether it's related to alteration, that's probably the, the most common interpretation. But I think it's not, not entirely clear what that uh, variation means. And the figure on the left maybe shows that in a different way. So these are histograms of the intensity of magnetization in the few drill holes that uh, have penetrated deeply enough that we have more than 100 samples of the, of the lavas to look at. And here they're histograms. The x-axis is a logarithmic scale. So there's quite a bit of variability. Um, and the top one I'll draw your attention to is actually the distribution of these uh, lavas that were collected along axis along the southern East Pacific rise. So they have the highest magnetization of any of these collections. Um, and if you go to the next one down, that's a, the youngest drill site that we have that has significant penetration. It's about, uh, I think it's 400,000 years old. So you can see that there's a big drop off between on axis and that first site. But then when you go to older ages, there's really, it's hard to argue for any systematic change in the, in the intensity of the magnetization. So if we put all that together, uh, if you ask me what my best guess is, um, I would say that alteration definitely does reduce the magnetization over time. Um, but it's probably by a factor of uh, two or so. Uh, maybe as much as a factor of four, but not more than that. And that we really don't know much about the, the time scale over which that alteration occurs. So these are a series of models. The ones on the, the left are for an intermediate to fast spread uh, crust, something, something like what's being generated at the Pacific Antarctic uh, Ridge. And then on the right for a, for a slower spreading rate. And you can see there's uh, these models, the different colors correspond to different uh, amounts of decay or reduction of remnants over different time scales. And really, the ones that look the most like the fast spread crust are ones that have uh, a very modest amount of, uh, of reduction in magnetization um, over fairly long time scales. All right, so now uh, you know something about the uh, what's still regarded, I think, as the dominant source of the anomalies. That's what happens in the lavas. Um, we know uh, comparably less about what happens in deeper layers, but there is a bit of information now that's come from drilling and from sampling on some tectonic exposures. 
So I want to tell you just very briefly about uh, what happens down in these deeper layers. And we'll start with the sheet of dikes, um, which uh, we have very few holes that have uh, drilled through and penetrated uh, all of the sheet of dikes. And probably the, the most representative one still is uh, the one shown here. These are results from hole 504B, which is in the equatorial Pacific. Um, and you see the, the lithologic column on the left there with pillows in the upper bit and then sheeted dikes below that. And then what's plotted are the are three magnetic parameters, the NRM, so that's the magnetization, the natural remnant magnetization, as a log scale. Um, and you can see that there is um, a difference between the magnetization and the lavas, which have maybe an average of about 5 amps per meter and you get down into the dikes, and those are more like one amp per meter or so. So the dikes appear to be have a lower magnetization. If you look at the middle diagram there, that shows the remnant inclination measured from samples. Um, and so that's something, this plot is an instructive one to keep in mind when you're thinking about anomalies. So uh, when you have lavas that are in place at the surface or dikes that are shallow and cool quickly, those are giving you spot readings of what the geomagnetic field is doing. So you expect some scatter, and this is kind of, I think, typical of what that scatter might look like. And then the right-hand diagram shows the Curie temperatures. So this is a proxy for the magnetic mineralogy as you go down deeper into the crust. And the top part, the lavas, if you'll recall, when they're freshly born, have uh, Curie temperatures of about 150 degrees or so. And you can see here that there has been some oxidation, it looks like. The Curie temperatures have increased in the lavas up to about three to 400 degrees. Um, and then when you go down into the dikes, you see that they have sort of uniformly high Curie temperatures that are indicative of having a magnetite that doesn't really have any titanium in there at all. So since those dikes have their basically basaltic in composition. Um, you might wonder why they have a different magnetic mineralogy and uh, they, why, why wouldn't they just have these titanomagnetites with lots of titanium in them? And the answer is that they, they start out that way, but that if they cool slowly, there's sort of a couple of processes that can uh, transform the magnetic minerals into essentially pure magnetite. So one of those is just if you cool slowly, um, the titanomagnetite will oxidize during cooling and dissolve ilmenite lamellae. So that's shown in the, the figure in the bottom right there. You have the, the little lamellae of ilmenite. There are also patches of ilmenite in there. So the titanium goes into those and what's left over is more iron rich, closer to pure magnetite. And then the figure at the left shows uh, results again from uh, this group doing TEM um, at the University of Michigan, this time on sheeted dikes from 504B, and documenting some really complicated um, alteration uh, processes in the sheeted dikes uh, from hydrothermal alteration in conjunction with this initial cooling. And you can get very complicated uh, groups of minerals, but if you look at the bottom of that, you'll see that the sort of end product of both of those is, uh, is also a titanomagnetite that has essentially no titanium anymore, so a pure magnetite. Uh, I should point out as well that this, these processes result in sort of making finer grains of magnetite, so we can make some nice small grains of magnetite that are very good recorders of the field. And then just briefly um, for the deepest layer, um, we have lots of um, drill holes that have sampled into tectonic exposures of gabbro for a little ways um, and two holes that have actually penetrated about a kilometer and a half um, into gabbros. And one of those is shown here. This is one from the Indian Ocean. It's hole 735B. And um, again, a couple of plots showing magnetic properties on the left is um, an indication of the types of gabbroic material. Um, for purposes here, we don't really need to worry about the different kinds of gabbros, but the magnetization of all those gabbros um, is shown in the middle column, again on a, on a logarithmic scale. So the red circles here are the 
our best estimate of what the remnant magnetization would be. And uh, those average about one to two amps per meter. So less than lavas, maybe a little bit less than the dikes, uh, but still significant. And then if you take a look at the right-hand diagram that shows the inclinations in this uh, drill core, and you'll notice that they're all very steep and they're pretty uniform. So that's um, an indication really of the slower cooling that occurs in the lower part of the crust. So you expect as things cool slowly that they'll average some of the magnetic field variations and you get a more consistent, um, consistent direction. So the gabbros, it turns out, also have essentially pure magnetite and for some of the same reasons as in the dikes. So, for example, we can have initial titanomagnetites that will oxy-exolve and produce these ilmenite lamellae and a relatively pure magnetite. Uh, so that's one mechanism. Um, another mechanism uh, to make pure magnetites in these kinds of rocks is that they can uh, be included as exclusion or in inclusions in silicate minerals. So. There's two examples on the left. The top one is a picture of the bright spots there are two different generations of magnetite that have exolved from a clinopyroxene. So the scale there is uh, about, I think the bar is about 10 microns. Um, and the bottom figure shows an example of hysteresis in a single grain of plagioclase. Um, so plagioclase by itself isn't magnetic. Um, but instead, the plagioclase has tiny magnetite grains in there uh, that are very magnetic and very nice, fine uh, magnetite particles. This particular one is from a gabbro um, at about 1520 north on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So, again, uh, fine grain magnetite that can be a nice carrier of the magnetic field, direction, and intensity, perhaps. And so if we put all those uh, things together, we come up with a model that looks something like this. Um, we've got uh, lavas, uh, which have the highest magnetization, uh, something on the order of five amps per meter is probably a good number. Uh, the dikes and the gabbros have lower magnetizations, but uh, they're both thicker. And so if you look at the signal that's coming from those various layers that's shown as the blue and red and green in the diagram, uh, you can see that the lavas really are the dominant one, but not by much. We really should expect that uh, we have a, a reasonably big signal from, uh, from the deeper layers as well. So the shapes of those curves is what I want to uh, turn to next and finish up with. And that is uh, to tell you something about uh, what's crustal accretion, uh, how does that affect the magnetic anomalies, and in particular the shape of the magnetic anomalies, which you may be interested in for uh, tectonic reconstructions. So um, one of the things that you might ask yourself is, is what sort of the overall resolution, what's the highest resolution that we could get out of, uh, of the magnetic field recording that we could get out of the ocean crust? And, and that has to do ultimately with the way that lavas accumulate and dikes are emplaced at the ridge crest. And this is a, a really classic study, I think, uh, done by Ken McDonald and his group in the early 80s, um, looking at the anomalies near the bottom at the East Pacific rise at 21 North. And so the figure on the left shows um, what the uh, polarity of the crust is, so pink here is the, is the Brune's normal polarity, the ridge axis is down to the, to the southeast, and the green is the reverse polarity lavas. The little tracks that are on there are from submersible surveys, and I know you really can't see these, but uh, alongside there, there are some green dashes that indicate where individual uh, pillow lavas, were, their polarity was determined by submersible. And then the same on the other side, you get uh, uh, red pluses that show where you had uh, normally magnetized lavas. And the boundary between the green and the red, or the pink and the green, is uh, the surface boundary of those two polarities, um, separated by that uh, solid gray line. And then if you look at where the polarity boundary is in near bottom anomaly data, sort of measured 100 meters, 200 meters above the bottom, uh, 
you get the dashed line. So the difference between those two is a, a very direct indication of sort of the resolution that you can expect at the ridge crest. So this is related to the transition zone width. Um, and you see that the spillover of the lavas here coming away from the ridge um, is about uh, 250 to 500 meters. And overall, this transition zone is going to be about a kilometer and a half wide or so. So that's sort of the ultimate resolution that you can get. And on the right, you'll see a cartoon um, showing the spillover of lavas, so resulting in an isochron in the lavas that sort of slopes back uh, towards the ridge crest. And then in the dikes, you might expect those to be intercalated. And then we'll come back to the gabbros down in the bottom, which uh, cool uh, more, more slowly and give a sloping isochron in the other direction. Okay, so um, a little bit more about shape. Uh, so I mentioned before um, the term anomalous skewness, which is any shape that's not predicted by a simple block model. And I just wanted to show you one good example of this. This goes into some estimate of anomalous skewness will go into uh, poles that are determined from anomaly skewness. Uh, this is an example from the Wharton Basin. And you'll see a fossil spreading center um, so the top profile is the original magnetic anomaly profile, uh, nothing done to it. And then the next two profiles down are phase shifted anomalies trying to de-skew them and make them look like uh, what you'd expect at the, at the pole. And what you can see is that if you look at the second one down from the top, that has a phase shift of 120 degrees and that does a pretty good job of uh, de-skewing the north flank but it takes a completely different value of 60 degrees to de-skew uh, to a comparable level the south flank. So that's an example of uh, anomalous skewness, which we can estimate uh, reasonably well when you have both flanks of the ridge crest. And so what, what you can do is you take an intermediate um, phase shift value and you try and de-skew both sides, um, but what you're left over with is something that still doesn't match um, the expected geometry at the pole. So that's anomalous skewness. Um, and the reason I, I bring that up again is um, you should ask yourself where that might come from. One possibility is that uh, you can generate anomalous skewness by tilting, by block faulting and tilting the source layer. So if you wanted to do that, uh, you need to, in the sense that was observed at the Wharton Basin and elsewhere, you need to tilt the, the blocks outward away from the ridge crest. So that's one possibility for anomalous skewness. Another is that if you have these non-vertical boundaries in the gabbro layer. So that's shown here in a couple of models for a normal polarity interval uh, down in the, in the gabbro layer that cools conductively. And the different colors here, we don't need to worry about so much. They're different uh, polarity durations and at different spreading rates. Uh, but the, the basic uh, message here is that when you have sloping boundaries like this in the gabbro, they're equivalent to a phase shift of about 45 degrees in the same sense as the, as the global observations of anomalous skewness. So here's one other way that you can generate anomalous skewness. And there have been some, um, another way you can do it, of course, is by uh, tilting of or deformation of the magnetic source. And this slide I just put up here to, to uh, tell you a little bit about some more recent ideas of tilting of the lavas that uh, I think we can check with um, skewness data or shape of magnetic anomalies. So the figure on the left here is a figure, um, a model essentially trying to look at the tilting of lavas uh, from uh, hole 801C. And the information that goes into this one is basically from logging, uh, downhole logging, looking at the orientation of chilled margins of lava flows. And the idea is shown in the model on the right there, is that basically as you load more and more lavas on, those lavas, in addition to making an isochron that slopes back towards the ridge, those lavas can also be tilted. And that tilt towards the ridge um, uh, could occur from, from lava loading. 
The diagrams on the right are actually another um, related to observations at another site, this time in the Atlantic, uh, sites 417 and 418. And in this case, uh, based on inclinations measured from the core samples. Um, and here the model is even more complicated. It's that we have lava loading in the same way as on the left. But in addition to that, we have uh, block tilting um, in the opposite sense. And the anomaly patterns on the bottom, I'll explain with this next slide. Um, essentially, if you tilt the lavas um, towards the ridge by this lava loading uh, process, that should show up in the anomalous skewness. Um, the trouble is that that's, the sense of that tilting towards the ridge crest is actually in the opposite sense of this overall anomalous skewness that's been observed on the ridges. So the top figure there shows an average 15 or 16 degree inward tilt by lava loading and the shape of the anomalies. And then at the bottom is the corresponding uh, amount of tilt, but this time by outward tilting. So that gives you a different skewness that's um, compatible with what we see for the overall skewness, anomalous skewness of, uh, of the seafloor. And here's the last slide. Um, so uh, I just wanted to mention one other um, um, kind of tilting that occurs in the crust. And this one, you're perhaps familiar with uh, in the last decade or a little bit more than that, there's the recognition that we have lots of places at, at slow spread crust where you have uh, gabbroic rocks and even upper mantle rocks that are exhumed and exposed near the, near the ridge crest at what are called oceanic core complexes. And I just put this in to emphasize that these as well are another source of tilting. Um, this particular figure at the top shows you one of these core complexes with nice corrugations. Uh, this one's at 30 degrees north on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, and this has been drilled. This is one of the places where we have a kilometer and a half of gabbro. And by looking at the directions in those gabbro samples, um, it's been inferred that this foot wall of this big normal fault um, has been rotated by 40 to 80 degrees. And the same sorts of numbers have been suggested for things uh, further south on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and a little bit less than this from places in the Indian Ocean. So the large-scale tilting of the, uh, of the gabbroic layer is also something that I think you might be able to address and certainly should be aware of when looking at uh, things like the, the skewness and how to use those for generating paleopoles. So I didn't put in a uh, conclusion slide. So uh, we can sort of repeat the, the topics that we've covered, but I hope I've convinced you that there's uh, a signal of geomagnetic intensity uh, that we can get out of looking at anomalies. And I hope you've gotten something out of uh, our discussion of the, the source layers for the magnetic anomalies and how those might translate into the shapes of the anomalies. So I think I'll stop there.